distinguished guests, friends and colleagues. And it's indeed a pleasure to be here in Valencia. It's a pleasure to enjoy the city, to enjoy the wonderful surroundings, to feel the vibrance, to feel the economic activity, to feel the welcoming spirit that there is in this city. And indeed, I'm very pleased and I thank our Spanish colleagues um, for having suggested that we come here, because the scope of these meetings is indeed for us to be able to move out of our, let's say, usual surroundings, common surroundings, normal surroundings, to come to places like Valencia, to visit the port, such as of Valencia yesterday, and also to visit the wonderful incubation center, which we saw as well, and to learn and understand opportunities, but also challenges. So that when we then go back to Brussels to carry out our work, and our work incidentally is to give the point of view of employers on proposed EU legislation, we can also take the lessons learned here. And immediately, I think I will <coughs> go to some um, uh, practical <coughs> issue, which I also heard yesterday, and which also I know a bit of myself. When we were given the presentation on the fantastic port operation in Valencia, where clearly there is a lot of commerce going on and it continues to flourish, we were also told that the new legislation coming in in January of the emissions trading scheme will have a negative impact on the port. And one of the possible likely impacts of this new legislation, which incidentally in itself is a good piece of legislation because it aims to reduce emissions, but the impact or the likely impact that they are expecting, and I also <laughs> know this firsthand myself, is that indeed traffic will be diverted from Valencia to other non-EU ports. <coughs> so whilst in essence we are talking about a good piece of EU legislation, there are very possibly impacts which maybe were not foreseen when the legislation was drafted, and indeed they need to be revisited. And this is exactly the kind of example of, the, of where you can have a good piece of legislation which could have a negative impact, and therefore it is our responsibility, and also together with with the Confederation of Valencian um, uh, Businesses and entrepreneurs to also voice our concerns on something like this. Also, yesterday when we saw the incubation center, it's a wonderful, wonderful project. You see these young people you know, with a bright future in front of them, with people ready to invest in them, and again, you could feel the energy, the enthusiasm, of these young entrepreneurs, which were it, were it not for the, I would say, the entrepreneurial spirit of the person who has, of, of Mercadone, who has set up the, the center, these people could possibly have not been able to realize their dreams or indeed create new products and services and commerce. And therefore, it is these kind of projects where then I feel that we, as entrepreneurs, but more importantly, as the European Union, we need to put our focus. We need to put our energy, because this is tangible results in a community that wants to achieve. So allow me also to formally thank the Business Confederation of um, Valencian Business Community, and also the Spanish Confederation of Business Organizations, the CEOA, who today are no longer an organization that we know, but today they are our real partners for co-organizing this event with us and hosting us today. And of course, I must immediately ensure to say a special thank you to our Spanish colleagues and the employers group, and especially to Isabel for the very hard work put in to organize this event. Allow me to, to quote something what Mario Draghi said recently in the Financial Times. And I want to quote it because I think it hits the nail on the head in terms of comes to the point that we are in, in a changing world where the dynamics have changed and therefore we ourselves need to revisit maybe all that we knew before. 
the way that we used to do business, our expectations of how to do business in the future. Don Mario Draghi said, the EU's past model of broadly relying on the US for defense, China for trade, and Russia for energy have ended. Europe's low productivity, high energy costs, and lack of skilled labor need to be urgently tackled. And I think this is again brings me to the point of what our mission is as the Empire's Group. At this very moment, our focus, as you all know, dear colleagues, and I have also had the possibility to share with the Vice with the Prime Minister and also other colleagues. Our mission at the moment is that we want a drive, a serious drive, a serious focus on competitiveness. We want to ensure that we create the right conditions for our businesses to be able not only to survive in this changing world, but also to be able to flourish. And of course, when we talk about competitiveness, we're talking about many dynamics. And one of the dynamics is indeed the single market. And I think we can easily say that um, uh, the single market, for me at least, is the fundamental element of our European identity, and indeed is the foundation of our economic strength. If we have a fragmented, weak single market, then we will have a fragmented, weak economy, and we will not have any kind of level of competitiveness. And I think um, uh, last week or two weeks ago, because now I get confused with the, the different dates, but we were in Bilbao, at the um, uh, SME assembly and in a, in a panel debate that I had with uh, Nicoletta, the title of this debate was a quote from Jacques Delors, nobody falls in love with the common market, with the single market. <coughs> and my opening line, and because it is, I believe it, is how can you not fall in love with the single market? The single market gives us the benefits of the freedom to trade, it gives us the benefits of the freedom to live anywhere you want in the EU. It gives us the benefit of, and you can study anywhere you want in the EU. And also it gives us <coughs> positive elements such as high standards of our food and high standards of environmental protection, etc. So I think we do not even need to question whether the single market is an important element for us or indeed whether it brings benefits for us. But like any other significant asset, those of us who are in business know that the single market needs maintenance and also needs to be renewed as we move along. And especially now, the EU, we are calling on the European Union, on the EU institutions, on the member states to set a strategic course of action to recover from the consecutive crises that we had caused by the pandemic and Russia's ongoing war, both of which have exposed <coughs> frailties in the supply chain, in the energy market, and indeed in our global dependencies. Strictly national responses, dear friends and colleagues, will fail. We all know that at the moment there is an ongoing debate uh, concerning state aid, concerning the amount of state aid that individual member states are putting into their economy at various levels for various reasons. And our very firm view is that this needs to stop. The state aid needs to stop and the state aid needs to be clawed back. Because this kind of state aid where the richer or the bigger countries can will spend more than the others will fragment our market, single market, and will slow down our decision making and it will weaken us also exposing us to threats of populism as we have also seen in some recent elections um, over the past few days. When it comes to competitiveness in the single market, we, of course, look towards, let's say, our competitors. So we are looking towards the US, we're looking towards China, we're looking towards Asia, and other major players who have, unfortunately, overtaken us, especially when you look at a number of indicators. And I always want to use numbers because I think numbers tell a convincing story. So when you look at the Europe's share of the global economy, in 1990, the EU had 25% of the global economy. 
This in 2020 went down to 15% and it is estimated to go down to 10% by 2050 if all things continue as they are. In 2008, the EU economy was at a par with the US economy in 2008. By 2020, the US economy grew by 50% more, 50% more. The gap in GDP between the EU and the US now stands at 105%. Between 2019 and 2021, foreign direct investment towards the EU went down by two thirds, foreign direct investment towards the US went up by two thirds. We all have been talking about recent developments in artificial intelligence, in uh, biotechnology, cloud computing, and unfortunately we find that on 10 of these leading technologies, the EU is falling behind on eight of them. So these are all indicators that clearly our competitiveness is failing. And this is why we continue to say that we need a rethink of the way we are doing things, of the way we are operating, of the way that we are creating the conditions for our businesses to grow. And um, uh, I would say one of the major items which give us a headache, which we try to all the time engage with the Commission and the Parliament in particular, concerns over-regulation. Now I know we've all heard about over-regulation, it was also mentioned earlier on, um, we keep on hitting on this. We do not want an environment with no regulation. Regulation is important for us in the business community because it provides certainty. And certainty provides confidence, and confidence allows business to flourish. However, we believe that we are now, we are now overdoing it, that we are facing it as SMEs, as companies, we are facing too much regulation. And again, we can get some numbers between 2017 and 2022, we find that companies have been burdened with 850 new pieces of legislation. 5,000 pages. This is not a joke. We say these numbers to have an impact. This is the reality. Now the Commission and the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has committed that they will reduce, they will revisit the EU legislation and they will reduce the reporting legislation by at least 25%. We have written to her, we have also communicated with the Commission and we are also working in partnership with Business Europe on this to we want specifically <coughs> what legislation is going to be reduced. But we want specifics, we need action now. Another example which I will give you and I look towards my friend Mr. Parcello uh, concerns the steel industry. Okay, the steel industry, we all know that the steel industry is a strategic industry for Europe, especially in these days. And here we find that in, you have 148 new pieces of legislation which have just come out or are about to come out, um, uh, 84 of which come out from the Green Deal. These are new obligations on an industry which we are working hard to keep here because we believe that it is of strategic importance. Our, our feeling uh, over the past years, whilst working in the environment of Brussels with the Commission and the Parliament especially, was that for too long businesses were taken for granted. It was as if businesses will always be there, jobs will always be created, wealth will always be created, and taxes will always be paid. And we have continued, we have been continuously saying that we need to revisit what we are doing. We need to revisit the environment we are providing. We want Europe to become again the place where businesses want to come, where businesses want to invest, where businesses want to start. Unfortunately, what we are seeing today is businesses either closing down and moving, for example, to the States, or else maintaining their operation but taking huge investment decisions 
in other continents. Okay? And this is certainly not good. <clears throat> Thankfully, over the past, I would say, year and a half, um, uh, we have seen somewhat of a shift in the focus coming, especially from the European Commission. We have seen increasingly that there's a focus on competitiveness, and I must emphasize that competitiveness does not come at the cost of the social element or at the cost of the environment. These have to work hand in hand. Without a strong economy, there is not enough money to pay our social policy, to afford our social policy, to protect our environment. They have to work hand in hand. And thankfully, as I was saying, the Commission seems to now be focusing more and more on competitiveness, and indeed, in the last State of the Union speech of Commission President von der Leyen, I think uh, we saw an unprecedented mention of competitiveness and the focus on bringing businesses back to the fore of, um, of our focus. We need to, as I said, we need to understand, and I think the quote from Draghi also points that out very strongly, we need to understand the world has been changing, and we believe that we need a fresh wave of political courage, of political investment in tackling the EU's global competitiveness, and also reducing our external strategic dependencies. And therefore, as employers group, we have three focuses, three key messages. One, that we need to have first have a competitive access to resources, if we are talking about energy, raw materials, labor, and capital. Second, we want open markets with equal rules, fair, equal rules. And thirdly, we want a business-friendly regulation and taxation environment. Only if these pillars are met will we be able to safeguard at the end of the day, our European way of life. I think we all want to maintain our European way of life. At the moment, we are struggling to maintain it, but this is what we all want. And, we, and indeed, we believe that in this way, we will also be able to achieve the green and digital transition, whilst maintaining the goal that Europe continues to be the best place to live. As you all know, there are two initiatives are ongoing at the moment. We have Enrico Letta, who will be who is drafting a report on the single market, on how we can strengthen the single market and the way forward. And we also have Mario Draghi, who is working on a report concerning the competitiveness of the European economy. Whilst these two reports have to overlap, they have to be linked, strongly linked, we have called and that's when I told this also to, to Mr. Letta, Professor Letta, when I was in Bilbao, we need to have brave reports and we need to have courageous recommendations. Because it is only in this way that we will achieve the qualitative step forward that we all want to achieve. And then, if we do indeed have brave reports with courageous recommendations, then it's up to us, the people in this room, to push for real change. Okay. I will stop here, and indeed, I look forward to a constructive debate over this morning. Thank you very much.